Welcome to the Making Sense Podcast. This is Sam Harris. A little housekeeping here. A couple of recent events that have converged on the topic of free speech, which I should probably say something about. We had those university presidents test- testifying before Congress about whether calling for a genocide of the Jews violated their school policies. And then we had the continuing saga of Elon Musk and what he imagines to be his own efforts to protect the free speech rights of Earth on his private platform, X. What do these two things have in common? Well, they both appear to have provoked a fair amount of outrage and confusion, mostly from the right and left, respectively. People don't even seem to know the principles they want to defend here. And the truth is, both of these cases have almost nothing to do with free speech, despite what everyone claims. The real problem with both Elon and the university presidents is that everyone involved has been displaying extraordinary levels of hypocrisy and moral confusion. I guess I'll start with Elon. The problem with what Elon is doing at X is not that he is a so-called free speech absolutist. He's nothing of the kind. The problem is that his behavior is impulsive and unprincipled and narrowly self-serving while being colossally self-destructive. I mean, how is this for free speech absolutism? Threatening to sue advertisers for declining to advertise on X. In fact, referring to them not giving him money as blackmail. Calling for CEOs like Bob Iger to be fired immediately for not wanting the brand damage or the brain damage that comes with being associated with all the chaos that Elon has created on X. I mean, how's this for principles? Here is a free market billionaire raging against people for not buying his defective product, literally threatening them with reputational and material destruction if they fail to give him money. I mean, who in their right mind would advertise on X at this point? And how does their declining to amount to censorship, much less blackmail? They're deciding where to advertise is their own freedom of speech and practice, right? So Elon's tirade at the New York Times Dealbook conference was fairly bonkers, at least on this topic. Not to mention that the actual policy of X with respect to free speech globally is to abjectly comply with the demands of every theocracy and dictatorship that actually wants to stifle free speech on its own version of X. So X is a safe space for tyrants. There is no free speech absolutism here at all. What Elon has become is not a courageous defender of free speech, but a conspiracist and a provocateur and a thoroughly Trumpian attention monster. He's at the center of a personality cult, and the experience is clearly harming him. It has certainly broken his ethical compass. Reinstating Alex Jones on the platform, as Elon did this week, wasn't a principled stand on anything. It was the quintessence of audience capture. Elon literally put the decision to a vote on X, and he let his dumb fans, most of whom now live in Conspiristan, simply tell him what to do. And then he welcomes Jones back in a Twitter spaces, along with Andrew Tate and Jack Posobiec of Pizzagate fame. This is a guy who openly collaborates with neo-Nazis. And there was Vivek Ramaswamy and Matt Gates. I mean, it was an absolute clown car. And then you have alternative media people who can't seem to understand how perverse all this is. It's all just about freedom and resisting global tyranny and becoming a space-faring civilization. No, it's not. It's about the absolute nullification of every sane, ethical, intellectual, or journalistic standard that we can rely upon to form our view of the world. I'm reasonably sure that if Elon polled his fans on X, asking whether he should kick the Jews off the platform, he would get an impressively positive signal. It might even be a majority that would say, go for it. I'm not even sure how I would interpret such a result. 
it might not be all or even mostly anti-Semitism. Right? He's being followed by millions of people who just want to see shit break. It's like that show Jackass. But rather than being rolled down a dangerous hill in a trash can or drinking a gallon of hot sauce, Elon is just fucking around with the levers of democracy. And of course, he can do whatever he wants with X. But it's the hypocrisy and incoherence and recklessness and grandiosity that are so appalling. It's the pretensions of self-sacrifice, all the while desperately seeking self-aggrandizement. It's the contradictions that are sickening and the total lack of self-awareness. He claims to be saving the world when he is just spinning out of control. He's using his immense reach to promote people like Alex Jones, along with random trolls and lunatics who no one would know about but for his influence. He is laundering the reputations of psychopaths, and he just doesn't care. He apparently has all the time in the world to do this, but he can't take a moment to figure out whether he's raising the profile of a professional anti-Semite or some imbecile who became famous for promoting Pizzagate. So the problem with Elon is not that he is overly committed to free speech. It's that he's apparently happy to function like a megaphone for people who want to make the world safe for Vladimir Putin and render American society ungovernable. And this is how he imagines he's improving our information landscape. Okay, it's the lack of ethical principles that is so disturbing. His fondness for Tucker Carlson is actually diagnostic here. Tucker is a person who boosted Trump for years. He probably aired 500 episodes of his show, stoking the fires of Trumpism. And yet now we know from his private texts, surfaced in that Dominion lawsuit, that he considered Trump a, quote, demonic force and despaired of his influence on American politics. That level of hypocrisy and dishonesty and disregard for the consequences of one's actions is evil. Tucker is not a person to collaborate with. I have no idea why Elon or the people around him can't see that, or seeing it, don't care. And speaking of failures of ethical coherence, we have the presidents of Harvard and Penn and MIT demonstrating all that is wrong with the diversity, equity, and inclusion apparatus that has been so carefully calibrated all these years by one grievance entrepreneur after the next. I mean, we've got people like Ibram X. Kendi and ta Coates making sure that the tiniest gears responsive to the least offenses are well-oiled and free to spin. I mean, you pick the wrong Halloween costume or use the wrong pronoun, and this machinery whirls into action and inscribes the judgment against you on the fucking foundations of the world. And yet somehow, in the aftermath of the most seismic atrocities against Jews since the Holocaust, the whole apparatus seizes up and becomes this useless pile of pseudo-intellectual junk. And we all watched it happen in real time before Congress. Almost everyone has commented on this, on the ghastly performance of these college presidents, and I don't think I have much to say that is new. I would just reiterate that it's not the policies, but the inconsistency. Again, the hypocrisy that got under everyone's skin. Harvard can have any policy around offensive speech that it wants. What it can't have is a policy that punishes microaggressions, that gets people fired or deplatformed for believing that there are only two genders or that meritocracy is worth defending, while simultaneously allowing angry crowds to call for the murder of Jews. Okay, it was the obvious inconsistency that drove everyone crazy. I mean, we watched this hair-splitting testimony in defense of the time-honored freedom of calling for the eradication of the Jews, while absolutely knowing that had those students been calling for the murder of black people or trans people, Harvard and Penn and MIT would have immediately reacted to prevent that speech, and the offending students would have been expelled from those institutions without apology. It's the hypocrisy. And I'll tell you what I think these colleges should do. They should be extremely tolerant of controversial speech. Okay, whether you're a student or a professor or a visiting scholar, I think you should be able to explore literally any ideas in a civil way. Right? You should be able to play devil's advocate about absolutely anything. And you should be able to invite the devil himself 
to speak on campus if you want to. But these institutions should be very controlling of protests. You don't have the right to mob people. You don't have the right to physically intimidate them. You don't have the right to block their movements. You don't have the right to pound on their doors. You shouldn't have the right to stop an event from proceeding as scheduled. Okay, that's where these institutions should hold the line. And I think they should all get out of the business of commenting upon everything that happens in the world. The problem with what they didn't say in response to the atrocities of October 7th was that their silence and their subsequent mumbling evasions were deafening by comparison to all that they had so effortlessly said, the absolute Vesuvius of howling sanctimony they produced over far more ethically ambiguous events in the past, and the killing of George Floyd and the subsequent protests being the clearest example. I think every university should take this opportunity, when we are safely between catastrophes, to say we're not issuing any more proclamations about events that all decent human beings should agree about. Whenever innocent people are killed in horrible ways, you can rest assured that we object to that. And now we're going to go back to the job of educating people who have paid us a lot of money to do so. Okay. Well, today I'm doing something a little different. This could be a one-off, or I might do this occasionally. This is not a replacement for my own podcast, but something I'm adding to the feed here. I recently discovered another podcast that I think is great and want to promote, and that podcast is Call Me Back, whose host is Dan Sinor. Dan is a co-author of the new book, The Genius of Israel, which is a New York Times bestseller. He also wrote Startup Nation, the story of Israel's economic miracle, which has been translated into more than 30 languages. Previously, Dan served in various foreign policy positions in the U.S. government, including in Iraq for over a year during the Bush administration. Anyway, since October 7th, his podcast has been, I think, entirely focused on conversations with Israeli journalists and officials and other experts. And he recently had my friend Douglas Murray on the show. And that's the episode I want to bring you now. Douglas has been on my podcast several times. He is an associate editor of The Spectator and written several books, including The Strange Death of Europe, The Madness of Crowds, and The War on the West. I wrote a blurb for The Madness of Crowds back in 2019. I'll remind you of that. This is what I wrote. We live at a time when many of the luckiest people on earth declare themselves among the most oppressed while seeking to oppress others in the service of a paradoxical new faith. And no one is so beloved or immaculate that he or she can't be dragged before the altars of this cult and offered up as a fresh sacrifice. In The Madness of Crowds, Douglas Murray shows how the apparent virtues of social justice, intersectionality, and identity politics have begun to stifle honest thinking on nearly every topic. In the process, he displays more courage and wit and basic decency than can be found anywhere among the woke. The book is simply brilliant. Reading it to the end, I felt as though I had just drawn my first full breath in years. At a moment of collective madness, there is nothing more refreshing, or indeed provocative, than sanity. And uh, I stand by those words. Douglas is always a breath of fresh air and basic sanity. There might be some daylight between us on certain political questions. I don't know. I should have him back on the podcast at some point soon to explore that. But on the issue of Israel and Hamas and related matters, there really is none. And so I now bring you Douglas Murray talking to Dan Senor about the war in Gaza. I'm pleased to welcome to this podcast for the first time my longtime friend, best-selling author, columnist, and public commentator, Douglas Murray, who I normally speak to or see in the UK, but has been in Israel for the last four weeks or so, doing some extraordinary work, and joins us today from Israel. Douglas, thanks for being here. It's a great pleasure to be with you and your listeners. Thank you for being in Israel. I know it's been difficult, but your observations and analysis and your responding to some rather inane questions from the media for all of us to watch and marvel at has been a real public service. Before I get into the specific 
topics and subtopics I want to hit with you today. Can you just give us a snapshot of you're in Israel during this traumatic time, and then just when you think it couldn't be more of an emotional roller coaster, you're there for the return of these hostages, which you've been covering quite closely. What's the mood? How does it feel to you? I'd say the mood in general is um, apprehensive. The hostage deal is, as all hostage deals involving Israel, are wildly traumatic and unfair and unequal and filled with mixed emotions. All Israelis want the hostages back. I spend a lot of time with the families, and indeed the whole nation knows about the families now. Every billboard, every illuminated sign that would have, you know, an advert for beer or something in the past, or a new type of washing powder, has the photos of the hostages. And we've had weeks of hearing from the families, hearing from the parents in particular of the missing children and abducted children, the stolen children. And so everybody wants them home. And uh, there's enormous trepidation, of course, and a great fear about the state that some of them are in. And indeed, if all 240 hostages, how many of them are alive? Which is a sort of conversation people have in private, but don't like having in public. And then there's the whole issue of, yes, everyone wants them home, but look at the price. The price, for instance, is three terrorists, criminals from Israeli jails, released for every Jewish child. Not the worst deal the Israelis have ever done in terms of person-for-person person swapping, but, but there's one other thing I should you know, stress at this point, which is that there's an awful lot of added trepidation because in perhaps the most unequal swap of all time, the Gilad Shalit swap more than a decade ago, uh, more than a thousand Palestinian prisoners inside Israel were swapped for, of course, one Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit. And one of the people swapped out was Sinwar, yeah. who is the Hamas leader in the Gaza now, who, who planned the October the 7th massacre. So it's not like the Israelis are releasing from prison, you know, shoplifters or something. Yeah. Uh, they're releasing the people who could be the next Sinwar. And this is just, yeah, it's a horrible mixture of emotions. As you mentioned, I was at the, I mean, I've been around many of the kibbutzim and the massacre sites since I've been here. And I know personally some of the families and I know their stories. And as I say, we all do. But, you know, when, when I was at the children's hospital on Friday night for the first children to be helicoptered in, from the swap in um, at the south of Gaza and then Egypt, where they were then flown to an Israeli base and from there to the hospital. You know, the whole of central Tel Aviv shut down, all the streets around the children's hospital, and um, people just got out of their cars on the streets and started singing and just showing support for the children as they came, came back home. And it's extremely hard, I think, for most Israelis, as it is, I mean, it's, a little, it's hard just for somebody to watch it, but the mixture of emotions, because it's this, yes, every one of these lives is priceless that Israel is getting back, but they know the price is going to be huge. Is there a sense, I mean, some Israeli journalists and officials I've spoken to believe that, yes, the price is potentially huge on the one hand. On the other hand, because of the strength of the Israeli response since October 7th, it's because of that that they've been able to get these hostages back, that Sinwar had to really start negotiating because of the pressure Hamas was under. This is not how Hamas would have wanted to get a pause implemented from the IDF might being unleashed. I don't know about that. I mean, um, there's one, that's a positive spin on it. Mm -hmm. A more, more negative view might be, well, um, of course, this is exactly what Sinwar must have expected. He must have expected after the scale of the battalion-sized attack on Israel on October the 7th. He must have known the Israelis would respond. I actually think there's, a, among many problems, I don't want to be an armchair analyst about this, but I mean, the aim of Israel, as expressed by Benjamin Netanyahu, is to destroy Hamas. Simultaneously, they have to negotiate with Hamas. I see these two aims as being obviously at some levels contradictory. Why would Hamas give back all the hostages if they know that the hostages are their golden tickets to survive? I mean, why would Israel not you know, go in even harder 
the the point of clearing the north of Gaza, making sure that civilians all moved south, instructing civilians to move south, was to have fights with Hamas, and that happened. But the Hamas leadership moved south, and the hostages are clearly moved south. So the war continues south. And um, I think most people are also aware that Hamas is playing not just the Israelis, but the international media and international opinion. They eke out these offerings of, you know, now maybe 15 people a day. They didn't abide by the agreement yesterday on the day we're speaking. They delayed. Looked like they might delay again tonight. They haven't, but uh, they haven't stuck to their side of the bargain. There were children they were meant to release with their mothers, and they haven't done that. They're deliberately splitting up families. They're making sure the hostages who come back have a family member still in captivity um, in order to ensure the hostages can't speak once freed with any kind of freedom, or at least will probably almost certainly feel they can't speak negatively about their captors. There's a lot of things going on, mm -hmm. and a lot of concerned that Hamas is controlling the thing. Yeah. There is this sense that Sinwar and Dave, the, the architects of, of October 7th, seem to have gotten at least some control, if not total control, back of the clock. That mm -hmm. You know, before yeah. the, yeah, that they, that the IDF had control of the clock, and now if they can dribble out hostage releases, it gives yeah. them some some control of the clock. Yeah, and, 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 and at this rate, they could keep extending the ceasefire mm -hmm. for weeks, if not months. Yeah, unless the IDF says, I mean, uh, not, not to digress down this topic, but it sounds to me like at the cabinet meeting when the security leadership was briefing the cabinet, uh, the war council, the security cabinet, and the full cabinet the other night, they argued that a four or five day pause, or even maybe even a few days longer, won't really set the military effort back that much, which was persuasive to most members of the cabinet. The question is, is there a limit to which the security apparatus could make that argument? Is there a limit where they say, look, you know, five, six, seven days is one thing, but many weeks is an entirely different thing that were just wouldn't hold up. That's not undermining the overall effort to eradicate Hamas. We'll see. I mean, as I say, the, 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 it feels already like the momentum of the operation is being lost. But. Okay. You write a lot about history. You've covered events in this region and specifically Israel for a long time, and you have been sparring with many members of the mainstream media, particularly from your home country, from the UK, uh, over the last number of weeks. And I want to go through with you, as I mentioned, a few mentioned to you before we recorded this, a few of the most common canards out there about mm -hmm. how we got into this mess. And um, basically, what I, you know, the kind of the list of lies is what I'd call them. Okay. So the first one that I hear all the time is the war against Israel by Hamas is the inevitable response to colonization. Hmm. That Israel is part of an extension of, the Jews in Israel are part of an extension of colonization, and what on earth do you expect the Palestinians to do in response? Yeah, uh, that is, of course, just the laying over of a form of social justice theory that has infected the minds of many Americans most of whom I'm afraid to say know nothing about history in general, let alone the history of this region, who simply have this interpretation, which is colonized colonizers, oppressed oppressor, indigenous peoples, interlopers. And it, it, I mean, they've got everything upside down, even if it was a useful paradigm in which to look at everything in the world, which it isn't. Of course, there's no colonization in Gaza other than by Hamas. All of Gaza was given over by the Israelis in 2005. I was speaking to a commander in the IDF. I said to him, uh, have you been here before? He said, yes. I said, when were you last here? He said, in 2005, tearing out family friends from their homes so that there wouldn't be any Jews in Gaza and we could hand it over to the Palestinians. And 18 years later, here I am back. So it's true that Gaza has been colonized, but it's colonized by Hamas. Admittedly, they were voted in by the Palestinians. and so. To that extent, of course, the Palestinians in Gaza do have some responsibility for Hamas. But no, the, the idea that it's, it's where colonization only really works, and the people who use that terminology really mean all of uh, Israel. And um, if you believe that all of Israel is colonized by these um, usurping Jews who weirdly have colonized a land of people whose religion was invented several millennia after Judaism came about, 
then you know you sort of haven't got any history right. But plenty of people talk that language, and it's just something that doesn't fit here. The the whole idea of colonizer colonized. I mean, um, well, what about that point though? That Israel leave Gaza out of it. That Israel mm-hmm. is a colonized state is was created by colonizers. Yeah, I mean. To believe that, you'd basically have to agree that everything in the world is colonized. I mean, by the way, if people want to care about indigenous peoples, I mean, first of all, the Jews are the oldest continuous group of people who lived in these lands. Um, The Palestinians as a people weren't even mentioned until some decades ago. They're a sort of recent invention as a people. Uh, If you went back a couple hundred years and said Palestinian, nobody knew what you were talking about particularly, whereas if you said Jewish, they certainly would. And by the way, you, you can tell the recentness of it, because if you ask people name of famous Palestinian, including Palestinians, they can usually come up with Yasser Arafat, and then they draw a blank. That's not the case with Jews. You'll notice that you, you can name an awful lot of Jews in history. And so the Palestinian claims are pretty thin. If the people do want to do the whole indigenous peoples thing, right. then at least don't be selective about it. Talk about the indigenous rights of the British. <laughs> or the French. Well, I mean, go on, try it. You know, right. if you want to play that game, play it everywhere. Don't play it in selective places. Well, when the UN was formed, when the UN Charter, 1945, there were, I think, something like 50 to 52 countries. 30 years later, there were 170 countries today, 192, 193 countries. So presumably, the majority of those countries, after 1945, were just made out of thin air. I mean, they were just like yeah, I mean, created. And I mean, so, I, I'm just sort it's of- It's just interesting that everyone's focused on Israel. Well, I also think that in general, the idea that Israel lacks legitimacy despite coming about by a vote at the United Nations, the idea that, we're, that anyone is still having this debate seems to me to be like having a debate about the most basic mathematical theorems. Pakistan was created within the same year as Israel. And not even the most fervent Indian nationalist says that Pakistan should be abolished or the peoples of Pakistan should just be moved out because they have no right to be there because they're a colonial construct, which, by the way, Pakistan was. And and Pakistan has territorial disputes. Pakistan is accused of oppression. I mean, it has all these frames that are applied to Israel, yet no one's suggesting- You could do it on any country. I mean, when you and I were growing up, if you wanted to signal some kind of virtue in the international arena, you'd do free Tibet. Does anyone remember free Tibet? Tibet remains doggedly unfree because it turns out the Chinese Communist Party doesn't give much of a damn about a sandal wearer in Brooklyn trying to signal decency. But unfortunately, when you're dealing with the world's democracies like Israel, they do actually listen to international opinion and international pressure, and, uh, and they don't like being misrepresented. So yeah, but I mean, the colonizer colonized thing is, I'm afraid, an invention of a particularly stupid form of American pseudo-academia from the last few decades, which is mainly done by people who do sort of social studies. Everything has studies after it, which of course means it's not a study of any kind. The next lie or canard goes, the October 7th attack was a response to genocide. Hmm. Well, of course, if, uh, if there was a genocide in Gaza, it would be the only genocide in history in which the uh, population massively bloomed. I mean, most genocides involve an attempt to eradicate a, a race of people. And uh, the population of Gaza has boomed in the last 18 years. So if you say there has been a genocide, either you've got to say there has been an attempted genocide and the Jews are no good at committing genocide. There are would-be genocidists, but they're just really bad at the job. Or, more likely, you're trying to wound the Jews. And that's all that's happening. Notice that all of the accusations against Israel, all the most vicious accusations, involve attempts to draw a parallel between the behavior of the Israelis and the behavior of Nazi Germany. Genocide, concentration camp, ghetto, like the Warsaw Ghetto, like the concentration camps, etc., etc. Hitler-like behavior. Now, there are several ways you can interpret this. You could say, well, that's the response of having a public culture in America and the wider West that knows nothing of history in general and only knows one bad thing from history, and that's the Nazis. And so, therefore, whenever you reach for any historical analogy, you will always reach for the Nazi analogy, whereas plenty of analogies historically could be much more relevant. You could say that, Actually, I think it's worse than that. I think that it's a deliberate attempt to wound and hurt Jews. But 
moving on from that, when people talk in this language about genocide and ghettos and concentration camps, that the Gaza was a concentration camp, by the way, unlike concentration camps from Nazi Germany, you'll notice that there are shopping malls in Gaza, beaches, uh, you know, relative freedom of movement are much more. Office, office buildings, billions of dollars being sent in from the Sunni Gulf. Yeah, I don't remember uh, the, the, the Jews in Auschwitz being given billions of dollars in aid by the international community to do with what they will, and then deciding just to enrich themselves and then go to the beach. So it's, again, only the product of people who either are fantastically ignorant or just want to wound Jews. And as for the sort of ghetto comparison, to claim that the 7th of October massacre was were a result of intolerable Warsaw ghetto-like conditions within Gaza, you would have to, first of all, not know that the Egyptians have a border with Gaza as well and have kept it doggedly closed. So that, for just for our listeners, so that's the, the border on the other side of Gaza. So there's the Israel-Gaza border, and then there's the Gaza-Egyptian border that no one ever really talks about. I mean, the kibbutzim around uh, Gaza were, of course, hiring, and there was meant to be an increase in the hiring of and the yeah. movement of passage of Palestinian workers from Gaza into Israel until the 7th of October massacre, when we discovered that many of the Gazans who were working inside the kibbutz were actually feeding back the information of door to door of how to kill who. And the people from Hamas who were found dead and alive had maps on their bodies, which showed that the, that the Gazan workers who these mainly peacenik left-wing Israelis were employing were actually acting as spies who led to the direct murder and massacre of the people who are trying to help them. But let's put that aside again for a moment and just restate the fact that, again, if it was a ghetto-like condition in Gaza, you would have to live under the impression, if you had this as a justification in your head, that the Warsaw Ghetto was filled with Jews who were oppressed and who, when they broke out, just immediately helped themselves to some rape and beheading. Does anyone know that that happened or think that happened or imagine that happened? Of course not. What a sinister and sick argument that is. The Palestinians couldn't help themselves. They broke out and immediately, inevitably, went to a music party of young people where they gunned people down, raped women and shot them in the head and continued raping them. It's how all oppressed people behave. The population size, just to put a a sharper point on it. When Israel took over the Gaza Strip in the West Bank, there were something like 1 million Palestinians. Today, there were over 5 million Palestinians. So to your point, if it was a genocide, it was- The least effective genocide in history. Right. Most bungled genocide in history. Why? I mean, I, I want to stay on this point for a moment because the speed with which October 7th happens, and there was maybe a day, I'll give it a day at most, two days, before there was this blowback in all these major cities, not all these, mm -hmm. many major cities in Europe and the United States, certainly on college campuses, mm -hmm. going right for genocide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The outrage wasn't being directed at, at Hamas. The outrage was being directed at Jews for objecting to being slaughtered. Yes. Again, the outrage was against, directed at Jews who objected to genocide. The speed with which so many people mm. in our most elite institutions in our most cosmopolitan geographies in the world, geographic centers in the world, went right to Israeli genocide. Oh, yeah. This is Israeli genocide. I mean, you wrote a lot, about, a, lot, a lot about this in your last book, but sometimes these things are so in excess that we become numb to them. Yeah. Me too. I'm like just used to Jews being accused of genocide on October 8th or October 9th, mm -hmm. as opposed to like saying, whoa. Well, on October 8th, as you know, I live in New York, or in America most of the time. On October the 8th, I went down to Times Square to the Palestinian protests there. Why were they protesting on October the 8th? Israel hadn't done anything yet, hadn't retaliated. Well, some of them were simply there to celebrate the massacre. There was a woman in a hijab waving a placard celebrating the massacre of 24 hours earlier, then Times Square. So Americans who think this is someone else's problem should first of all realize that the, the people who heart the rape, massacre, beheading, and burning of Jews are right in your midst in America and have no fear at all from the authorities or anyone else of showing themselves up in public like that straight away. The second point that needs to be made is, I've seen this before, as you did. I remember very much that when they were still trying to identify bodies in the rubble of the Twin Towers in 2001, 
There were people like the sickly academic in the UK, Mary Beard, who wrote in the London Review of Books that it was impossible to keep out of one's mind the fact that to some extent, she said, to some extent, we all feel the same thing, which is that America had this coming. Now, how many Americans want to be talked to in that way? How many Americans within days, if not hours, of a massacre of 3,000 Americans want to hear people telling you, you had it coming? I wouldn't like to be talked about or to in that tone of voice. But the Israelis are expected to put up with it. it. You've got to understand the context. As if there's a context to going to a music festival and gunning down lots of people in their 20s and tying the women to trees and raping them. And putting live babies in ovens. As if there's a context to going into Beiri and near Oz and kibbutz after kibbutz of left-wing peaceniks in the main. And as I've seen myself, door after door, ruined house after ruined house, people in their shelters, bomb shelters, because they were used to bomb shelters, because they have to be used to the bombs, because they come over so used so often. But they didn't know that people would come door to door, 4,000 people from Gaza with Kalashnikovs and RPGs and much more, door to door, so the, the safe rooms don't lock. I spoke to one man whose grandsons were in their house on their own because their mother was out when the Hamas death squads came. And he was on the phone trying to sh tell the boys, I think they were 13 and 15, how to hold the safe room door shut when the grown men of Hamas on the other side were pushing it to open the door the other way. And they were abducted. They were stolen. They were kidnapped because they couldn't hold out, not against grown men. And you see the safe room doors in these kibbutz. You know the ones where it was an even worse ending because you see the bullet holes all around the handles because that was a faster way in for Hamas. Now, if anyone wants to tell me that this is a legitimate answer to oppression, I say you are sick in the head beyond comprehension. And you should not presume that the Palestinian peoples are all necessarily and must be for all time as sick as you think they are. It seems that lots of critics of Israel's response argue that Israel has a right to self-defense. The ones that are not as extreme as the ones we're seeing marching in major American cities and European cities and college campuses, the, the ones that aren't as extreme but still critical of Israel, they, they argue, look, Israel has a right to self-defense but must be more mindful, more thoughtful in terms of how it wages its war. When, Israel's, when people say Israel has a right to self-defense, it's always followed by a but. I don't know why. I don't know any other people who is always a but. But there's a reason for that, which is the people who say that, what they really mean is Israel is allowed to do something rather tokenistic, and then it must settle for a draw. I believe that one of the reasons why there's been an ongoing war for so long between Israel and the Palestinians is precisely because the international community and others keep on making Israel fight to a draw. Never is Israel allowed to win. What would winning be? Winning would be, in this case, for instance, with Hamas, destroying Hamas and making sure that no Hamas-like organization exists in the Gaza again, that no rocket ever again fires out of Gaza into Israel. That would be winning. Everything else is a draw. And I have very little sympathy for the putative supporters of the Palestinian peoples, who first of all think that Hamas is the necessary spokesgroup of the Palestinian peoples, when they completely ignore that when Hamas was voted in, they promptly made sure there was never another election and killed all of their Fatah and other Palestinian opponents. And by the way, the people who doubt that should even look at very anti-Israel organizations like Amnesty International, who nine years ago in 2014 said that the Shifa hospital in Gaza was the Hamas headquarters and what's more was the main place where Hamas brought Palestinian prisoners and tortured them and killed them. It was known as the interrogation center and torture chamber of Hamas in Gaza. This is what Hamas do. This is what they're like. But if you want to pretend that the Palestinians should live under that, then be my guest. There is no reason why the Israelis should continue to have to live beside a 
place where endlessly rockets will be fired to the extent that every house is used to them, to the extent that every house has to have a bomb shelter. I mean, it, it, to say that Israel has to learn to live with that threat is to say Israel, right, it's, it's existential. I, I speak to endless, endless people who are refugees from these towns, from Ashkelon and places like that. I speak to a family earlier, lovely young couple bombed out of their apartment. They were in the safe room in Ashkelon uh, with their three young children. And uh, the uh, a missile hit their apartment, and thank God they were okay, but their apartment is destroyed. How can they move back if you're within missile? You know? And to be clear, Ashkelon is not even one of the towns that's right on the border with Gaza. I mean, Ash- no. Ashkelon, you're already <laughs> Long way. into the, much closer to the yeah, center of Israel. But the main thing about this thing of the Israel's not, Israelis not being allowed to win is that I, th- I think that's intolerable, and I think it makes for perpetual conflict. I think conflicts mainly finish when one side wins and one side loses, and the side that loses knows that it's lost. But I find this perverse idea that the Israelis, you know, this isn't just with this conflict, but in almost every conflict involving the Arabs and Israel, in, f- Israel, in fact, every conflict from 1948 up till now, what always happens is the Israelis are hit or invaded, and they are told by the international community, you can do something in response, but you mu- mustn't win. You mustn't answer a question. I mean, I think the Palestinian question is effectively an insoluble question at this point. There is going to be no Palestinian state, partly because Fatah PA in the West Bank celebrates the October the 7th massacres. And we saw a couple of days ago with the lynching of two Palestinians by a crowd, all of whom, by the way, uh, recorded on their mobile phones. So these are the peaceful people of the West Bank as well. There's going to be no Palestinian state because the Palestinians have made sure yet again there's just no chance. But I don't see why this insoluble problem of the Palestinians has to be a problem for the Israelis. Giving somebody an insoluble problem and telling them to solve it seems to me to be a kind of un- unfair and cruel thing to do. Give it to somebody else to solve. Give it to the Egyptians to solve. Give it to the Qataris or the UAE or the Jordanians. Give it to somebody else to solve. Why should it be Israel's insoluble problem? But of course, what happens is effectively that, and it's happening at the moment with Hamas, Hamas is behaving in the way that the thing that's most similar to it would be if you and I were standing at a bus stop and I punched you in the face for no reason, or for reason I could say went back to some inherited feeling of oppression. And then you turned out to be a jujitsu master and informed me of this fact. And I said, oh, can we just go back to the moment before I hit you? Would you mind? That's the situation Israel is in with Hamas. Hamas wants to go back to October the 6th. Most of the international community wants to go back to October the 6th. There was a ceasefire of a kind. Hamas broke it. Hamas has to pay the price. The argument of proportionality. Now, there are two versions of proportionality. One is under international law, when you take out a military target, according to international law, I'm not weighing in all the various interpretations, but at least according to Matthew Waxman, who we had on this podcast, who's a, who's a professor of international law at Columbia Un- Law School, is that the, the collateral damage in going after a target has to be proportional to the military gain. Right. Then there's this sort of media interpretation of proportionality, which is actually not based on the international rules of war. It's a different kind of proportionality. It's like Israel was hit and Israel's now hitting back, quote unquote, harder. And that's not proportional, as though, as though it's a math game. First of all, I mean, you should hit back harder if you want to win. When we want, wanted to win wars in America and Britain, we always hit back harder. Why would you hit back softer? What's the point in that? You have to hit back harder. If you want to destroy an opponent, you hit them as hard as you can. Now, of course, as is often pointed out, and I've seen it with my own eyes, so I know it's not just an Israeli talking point, the Israelis do everything they can to minimize civilian casualties. Are there civilian casualties? Yes. And it's terrible. I think they're all the responsibility of Hamas for starting a war. But when Hamas spends billions of dollars of international aid from your American taxpayer and from your British taxpayer, and great use of our tax dollars, that was, and funnel money to the authorities, the Hamas, uh, you, uh, you would think that they might build bunkers for their people if they think that they're going to start a war. But of course, no, they have built bunkers for the Hamas leadership, and the Hamas leadership has said that themselves on plenty of occasions. The bunkers, the tunnels, they're for us. The Israelis, of course, do it the other way around. The Israelis use the IDF and the other security agencies to protect the Israeli people. Uh, Hamas wanted to kill as many civilians as possible 
on October the 7th. That's why they chose the softest imaginable targets, like a music festival, like small kibbutz, and so on. They deliberately target civilians, and the Israelis accidentally hit civilians. And there's every difference in the world with that. But the proportionality argument is, I mean, first of all, there's an argument I made quite early on in this conflict, which was, if you do actually believe in this thing of proportionality, which I really only hear about involving wars in Israel, I've covered plenty of wars. I was in Ukraine last year. I um, hear nobody saying that the Ukrainians have to have a proportionate uh, response to the uh, annexation of major parts of their country. They're just, everyone hopes that they can take those parts back. But it's always the Israelis you have the discussion of uh, proportionality with. And if, as I said, if you actually want to follow that through, then proportionality would mean that the Israelis, to the extent they had the right to respond to Hamas's massacres of October 7th, should find precisely the same number of women in Gaza as Hamas found and rape them. They should find precisely the same number of babies that Hamas killed on October 7th and behead and kill them. And stop only when they've killed exactly the same number of people as Hamas killed on October 7th. Now, some people might say, well, the population of Gaza is about a quarter of the size of the population of Israel. So actually, if it was properly proportionate, you would only rape a quarter of the women that Hamas raped, and you'd only kill a quarter of the babies. And is that okay? Come on, this is like wildly perverted thinking. Wildly perverted thinking. It's not even thinking. And, and by the way, I mean, just look at what the US did to ISIS yes. in Raqqa and Mosul. I mean, the idea of proportionality is, but and I supported what we did against ISIS. It was the idea that we would talk about proportionality was preposterous. We flattened these places. When when France bombed the Cote d'Ivoire in two thousand three or four, the international community didn't say, "Don't you know? Don't do this. Don't be you know. You've got to be proportionate." The French just did whatever they want, as the French always do. It's only Israel that people care about, and that's because most people don't want Israel to win. I mean, as far as I can see, I'm saying most people. I mean. I mean a lot of people are decent in the world. And well, most critics. Most critics. They just don't want Israel to win. And so they come up with this BS about proportionality. Hamas is an idea, some say. And no matter what Israel does here, it cannot bomb away an idea, many critics argue. And that, you know, your, your analogy about in this hostage exchange, there may be a future sinoir. Mm -hmm. the, the, some critics argue, well, in some of the bombed out civilian areas in North Gaza, there are sinwars in the making who otherwise may mm -hmm. go another way. They then get radicalized because of Israel's quote unquote indiscriminate bombing. And you will never defeat an idea that will be so attractive to a vulnerable victim of Israeli warfare that becomes radicalized as a result. Well, it's a very strange argument, isn't it? Because we've destroyed ideas all the time. We destroyed fascism. Right. So, so, and Nazism was much more robust, both financially, infrastructurally, yeah. and numerically than Hamas yeah. is. Hamas is a, is a pushover compared to Nazism. We destroyed communism. I mean, it's true that it still thrives in Berkeley and various American college campuses. But otherwise, communism is a, is a pretty defunct ideology. Even the CCP sort of steps away from some of it now. Uh, Japanese imperialism was a very strong idea. And uh, the Japanese were almost as dedicated as Hamas and ISIS to dying for that idea. But we so destroyed Japan's infrastructure and leadership and indeed cities. And there is no, there is no talk these days, no serious talk. I mean, there's some discussion about indoctrination in Japanese schools. Sometimes it comes up about the nationalism that some people feel is always sort of nodded to within Japan's schools. But I don't think there's any serious movement in Japan that is because we were treated like this, uh, we're going to go back to Japanese imperialism. And that's because we bombed the hell out of them and defeated them, because otherwise they would have defeated us. And it's a very good thing too. Again, I get back to this point, you have to lose. You have to lose. Your enemy has to lose. And we won't necessarily get unconditional surrender. Israel will not necessarily get unconditional surrender from Hamas, but it could get unequivocal defeat of Hamas. I would like unconditional surrender, but we'll see. Yeah. Douglas, you wrote this book, The War in the West, which was a mm. New York Times bestseller, very provocative book, long before published long before October 7th. Where does October 7th fit into your thesis? The War in the West is about the anti-Westernism of our time, whereby every single Western country is treated by this bizarre standard where we're all meant to have original sins and uh, we must atone for them. And of course, no other country in the world has the same thing. 
our history has been rewritten in America and Britain and elsewhere as one of uh, terrible oppression. And it's all looked at through this lens of negativity and evil and wrongdoing. And um, I mean, to put a very <laughs> long and scholarly book into simplistic terms, I would say it's, it's about, well, it's very strange that this only happens to the world's Western democracies and it doesn't get done anywhere else. I see no one going to Uganda and saying, what's their original sin? Um, most Ugandans would look at you with some confusion if you raise the issue. Uh, I don't see people uh, going to Jordan and saying, what's your original sin? And by the way, guys, you've never done anything good. It's all been horrible. Uh, and in fact, there are countries in the world that are much more deserving of such an interpretation. But uh, yes, Israel obviously suffers from this as well, this idiot American idea of colonization, of first peoples, of oppressor oppressed, and so on. This has been transplanted onto Israel as it's been transplanted onto every other Western country, Canada, Australia. We've all got versions of the same virus. And uh, yeah, the response to October the 7th in America in particular, in parts of America in particular, is a vindication of the fact that this horrible, horrible mind virus has wrecked the minds of young people in particular to the extent that they don't realize that they are being the Nazis. If they got their wish, and I hope to God they never do, for themselves apart from anything else, if they got their wish of the river whose name they don't know to the sea who they couldn't point to on a map, being entirely Judenrein, which is, of course, the desire not just of Hamas, but of the Palestinian Authority, who are meant to be the putative next failed Arab state, they would be Hitler. What they're chanting for is the final dream of Hitler. So they should know that and wish to God that they never get their chant fulfilled. Yeah. You wrote in the New York Post, you go back to the 2014 Boko Haram mm. hostage taking of. Christian schoolgirls yeah. in Nigeria. You wrote here, and I'm quoting, my mind keeps going back 10 years ago to Nigeria in 2014, as some readers will remember, on the night of April 14th, 2014, 276 mainly Christian schoolgirls were abducted by terrorists from the Boko Haram group. It happened at a school in a town called Chibuk in Borno State. In some ways, it is obvious why there was such international outrage at the incident. After all, this was 276 schoolgirls kidnapped by an Islamic terrorist group, even a world that has seen the Beslan school siege in 2004 and was starting to see the workings of ISIS still had capacity to be shocked. So you take this very important snapshot and let's just, every celebrity would hold up these you know, mm -hmm. signs, hashtag bring back our girls, including the first lady, including Michelle Obama. So this was widespread. Again, I, I, I'm so, sort of numb to the reaction now, post-October 7th. But like when I read you lay it out like that, it's like, what is going on? It was hip. It was chic. It was, it was in vogue to demand children be returned. Yeah, it was, like free, it was like free to bed. Right. Yeah, it, it was the cause du jour. Again, it did no good, by the way. Um, I covered the conflict in northern Nigeria in recent years and um, was in Borno State. I I've been to the places the Chibok schoolgirls were taken from. I've, I've, I've covered the massacres of Christians there by Fulani militia and others and know that conflict pretty well. Yeah, it was a cool uh, thing to be on the side of, to say, uh, bring back our girls. And I don't doubt but it. But it when you say clear. it had no effect, when you say it had no effect, meaning... Oh, well, I mean, um, the Nigerian government... Boko Haram could care less. No, I, well, first of all, Boko Haram couldn't care less and are, are, like the Chinese Communist Party, not vulnerable to international pressure. It turned out that a hashtag couldn't stop Boko Haram. Who knew? And secondly, though, of course, the schoolgirls largely, I mean, some were returned in, 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 there were drips and drabs of returnees. The Nigerian mili um, military and government was so incompetent. Again, I saw this in my own eyes. One of the Chibok schoolgirls was only returned um, in April this year. So, the international campaign was, as, as often, noisy and largely ineffective, but it did put some pressure on the Nigerian government, not least to pay PR agencies to try to cover up the fact of their own inadequacies, but that's another story. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I spent a lot of time with the families of the abducted hostages from October the 7th, and um, I try not to say to them what 
is always on my mind like this, which is, where is the international outcry? And I'm afraid you can only come to the conclusion, as we see with the people, particularly women, it's noticeable for interesting psychological reasons we can't get into, but who rip down posters of kidnapped Israeli children. One can only come to the conclusion that either internationally people don't care that much about Jews or actively dislike them, or they think that the stealing of Jewish children and the likely death of some of them is uh, just one of the eggs that needs to be broken in order to make the terrific omelette of the Palestinian state. I think probably most are in that second camp. And all I would say to those people is what George Orwell said to the Stalinists he roused within the 1940s who eventually admitted that, okay, the show trials of 37 may have happened, okay, the gulag may be there, okay, political, okay, there might be no... Blah, 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 blah. And uh, eventually Orwell heard him say that fatal phrase, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. And George Orwell said, well, where's your omelette? And I would say to the people who say, effectively, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. You can't make the Palestinian state or get the Gazans free without breaking heads. And having not only seen the unedited massacre footage of October the 7th, but having spent too much time in the massacre sites and indeed in the morgues and the places where the, the bodies are still being identified in the mortuaries, I would say, um, go to those places, tell me this was worth anything and then point to your bloody omelette. Douglas, we will um, we'll leave it there. Very powerful. If you had one impression from your time in Israel that you would like to break through to people listening to this podcast and others that you feel just people don't get after having spent a month with the Israelis during this horrific, traumatic nightmare, what would it be? One of the most powerful, there are too many powerful things to list, but one of the most powerful conversations I had in recent weeks was at one of the trauma hospitals where a father who had lost, who had been in the safe room with his wife, daughter, and son, and they were there for hours, they were smoked out, they'd burnt down the house, they were all suffering from smoke inhalation, and then the fight, the terrorists of Hamas found the window and threw grenade after grenade in and shot and shot into this small room. Father lost both his legs. His wife was killed in front of him, died in front of the children. And then his boy, who had been shot in both sides of his chest, bled out in front of his sister and father. And um, his father said to me, I've been a leftist all my life, all my life. I want nothing but potato fields from here to the sea. I'm afraid that is the feeling a vast number of Israelis now. Hamas killed the possibility of peace. People in Israel know that. The wider world should know that. Douglas, thank you. Stay safe. Keep doing what you're doing. Hope to uh, get you back on, but until then, I'll, I'll be, and I think like many folks listening, following your reporting and commentary. Thank you very much.